Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Meredith Cunningham, Communications Manager at Covenant Health. As a reminder, the information provided during this event is for information purposes only. If you have any medical questions, please reach out to your primary care or healthcare professional. Now, let's begin. Joining us during this live event will be Dr. Katie Henley, neurologist, and Dr. Valerie Johnson, clinical psychologist, both from Covenant Medical Group. Today, we'll be discussing how mental health professionals and neurological experts have teamed up to embrace a new way to treat patients and their families while dealing with mental health as it's related to brain injuries and neurological healing. Ladies, thank you both for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks thank for the you. invite. Absolutely. Well, let's start by having you each tell us a little bit about your role at Covenant Medical Group. Dr. Henley, let's start with you. Um, yes, um, I am a neurologist and I do focus um, my outpatient clinical practice on movement disorders. So some of the more common ones would be Parkinson's disease, tremor, um, but definitely see a wide variety of neurologic conditions, dementia, headache, stroke um, here at Covenant. Okay. And Dr. Johnson, you're a recent add to our team, but how long have you been here and what are you bringing to our table? I've been here for about a year. I'm a clinical psychologist um, based out of the Covenant Neurology Clinic in uh, Lubbock. I provide psychotherapeutic support to patients with chronic health and neurologic conditions, as well as psychological testing to help clarify cognitive functioning. And also I make recommendations for supportive intervention. Now, Dr. Henley, you've always said your mission is to treat not only the patient, but the whole family. So you, can you both tell us kind of how this position was created um, at our Covenant Neuroscience Clinic? Definitely. Um, I know that among the physicians, the neurologists, the neurosurgeons, um, uh, having a clinical psychologist um, was definitely a gap that we needed, not only sort of pre-diagnoses, so many of the diseases that we diagnose, unfortunately, we don't have biomarkers. We don't have confirmatory tests. And so our investigation and our workup um, often lasts several months, and it requires lots of different evaluations from, um, you know, MRIs, um, blood work, certain testing, but also evaluating the cognitive and the, the psychological um, information was a big gap that we had. Um, but then not only that, once we do establish a neurologic diagnosis, um, support in that area in terms of ongoing changes, um, lack of changes, and then definitely um, therapy to support the psychosocial and the psychocognitive impacts of neurologic disease um, was just something we were lacking, not only at Covenant, but in the Lubbock community in general. And so we were having to send people to the Metroplex and far away, um, which is really a burden um, on this patient population and their families. And so uh, Covenant Medical Group um, supported um, our need and our request for that. Um, and we brought in Dr. Johnson a year ago. And Dr. Johnson, what kind of um, things have you been able to implement in your year here? Well, I do provide psychological testing to help with the clarification of the cognitive functioning. Um, I also provide psychotherapy um, to kind of support patients with neurologic conditions um, around the emotional implications of coping with um, such a condition. And um, with family involvement, of course, that's a really important piece. So how does support from these two professional disciplines create a whole person care experience for the patient and their family? I would say the vast majority, um, it, you know, I would say even 95% of the patients with neurologic disease do have a component um, of not only cognitive impairment, but anxiety, depression, um, as truly an, an organic symptom and um, part of their disease. I mean, for a neurochemical level, um, this is, it's, you know, it's impactful to their disease. Um, but not only that, just dealing with um, the burden that neurologic disease has on their life, um, their current life, what they thought their life was going to be like, um, is very real. And if, if that component is not um, touched on, not called out, not treated and managed, then, you know, I can give them medicine every day, but it's not going to lead to an improvement in their quality of life and improvement in their well-being. Um, and that's just the patient. And then, you know, they most always have another person in the room, their caregiver. Um, and, and I tell my patients, if your caregiver is not well, then, then I know that you're not going to be well. And so I have to address um, the impact that their disease is having on their caregiver as well to ensure 
you know, that the, the time that they're not, they're not in my office that they're being taken care of. And so working with Dr. Johnson and she, you know, can give you some examples of how we approach that. Um, you know, in the short time she's been here, we've already seen huge impacts and huge benefit um, in, in the face-to-face -face appointments that we have and the way their disease is impacting their quality of life. Dr. Johnson, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that there are behavioral, emotional, interpersonal types of barriers to treatment um, that people are facing. Um, and so this is really a way to kind of holistically address some of those barriers so that people can, you know, better comply with their treatment reg regimens um, and make progress. So Dr. Johnson, just to add to that a little bit, can you describe how this integrative support from neurology and behavioral health might look when working with a patient in their family, maybe a generic example of how you've been able to help someone? Yeah, yeah. In terms of integrative, um, we're really fortunate that here in our clinic, we're able to collaborate very closely and communicate. You know, we're right across the hall from each other. Um, we can discuss, um, you know, different patients' concerns. Um, we've even at times been able to um, address concerns together in the room. Um, with patients and make recommendations for treatment planning um, together as a team. Wonderful. I don't know if patients and their families realize, you know, what an impact of, say, you know, maybe a struggle with an adult child, um, a difficult marriage, um, you know, other social burdens that they carry, what that does to them on a physical level in terms of the impact on their health. Um, and so, we, you know, as I maybe sense things in appointments and or Dr. Johnson may sense things in, in those therapy appointments, we're able to, you know, kind of call those out. And, and maybe their treatment plan um, for the next few months is not to increase their medicine, but it's actually, you know, to work on their wellness, to work on their marriage, um, to maybe reconcile with a family member. Um, and that, that really does lend towards, you know, improvement in their disease. Um, and so, you know, without this relationship, we wouldn't have been able necessarily to address those things. Another example is, you know, talking about relationships, communication strategies um, for communicating with a loved one um, who's dealing with a neurologic illness um, or communicating with a care partner. Um, also, you know, things like sleep hygiene. Um, that I work with patients on here in the office. Um, you know, often people will kind of go to, you know, sleep medication and, you know, that can help, but um, only so much if, you know, sleep hygiene is not taken care of. So that's, we do implement some evidence-based therapeutic pro um, practices in order to help, you know, behaviorally, make behavioral change. Somewhere, Dr. Chris Rose, our medical director of the sleep clinic, is shaking his hands in the air for the rest of the day. Dr. Johnson. Um, yes, sleep is very important. It's not a luxury, it's a need. So, um, what information would you want a family to know about the services that are available in this clinic? We just want you to know that we're here. But you don't have to face, you know, these concerns alone. It's a very difficult time of year. Um, if you need support, you can reach out. Um, we even have telehealth support available for mental health um, services. So if your insurance, if that's part of something that your insurance covers, we have that available as well. And I would say, um, you know, I would hope that um, as we do, you know, videos like this, that we can sort of debunk the stigma of mental health. Um, and I would, I would encourage um, people, you know, in my clinic, I sort of compare it to, you know, high blood pressure, um, which is a true medical problem. And if we ignore it and we don't respect it, um, the outcomes are not going to be good. I mean, so you do have to not only, you know, maybe accept medication, but also adjust your lifestyle because over the long term, if mental health is not addressed and treated not only appropriately, but aggressively, um, that your physical health just will not, you know, it will not be as, as best it could. So, you know, it's hard to come in and say, I feel like I'm anxious or I'm depressed or I'm struggling. Um, but this is, you know, your physician should be a very safe environment to do that um, and should be able to point you to getting the help and the treatment that you need. Let's dive a little deeper onto that and acknowledge the elephant in the room right now, COVID-19. Um, what are the implications if someone is ignoring things that they're having either neurologically, physically, or with their mental health because they don't want to come to the hospital because of COVID-19? What, what happens if people ignore these issues and put them off? 
Yeah, um, that's difficult because I will even say in my patients who are not ignoring it are still suffering from what, you know, what has happened this past year. Um, Dr. Johnson and I were having a recent conversation about just the loss of human connection that we're all feeling. Um, and she and I are still coming to work every day, but we have still lost human connection um, through all of the things that, that we should appropriately be doing for COVID-19. Um, so, you know, I would have a hard time um, hearing anybody say that they're not struggling with mental health and what's happened this year. I just don't know that, that anybody could say that because it's just so far reaching. Um, and, and so I think now's as good a time as ever to try and, and identify how everybody can improve their mental health. I mean, myself included, still trying to, you know, have this ongoing conversation of, of how can I improve my own mental health. So I would say it, it is affecting everyone, whether or not we admit it or not. Right. And I would just add that people with pre-existing mental health concerns, which we just talked about many people with neurological conditions are, um, are at higher risk of developing more severe problems during crises like COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for many people and many of our patients, the holidays have been a time that they usually look forward to. Um, you know, they feel less isolated during that time. Um, you know, but we're all feeling that isolation and that can really exacerbate depressive symptoms or pre-existing mental health concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of tips. It's really important that people make a plan for reducing feelings of isolation, um, whether that be the virtual meetups with family members or friends, phone calls, um, and structuring days, um, structuring your day in a way that will provide you with small things to look forward to every day to help combat that sense of isolation. I have found that my dog is a really good friend to have around right now. Hug <laughs> yes. the puppy. So. <laughs> so, well, that was a great uh, segue, Dr. Johnson, into my next question, which you've kind of mentioned before that um, those with neurological issues have a higher risk, if not more kind of mental health issues. So can you dive a little bit deeper into just like exactly what kind of support you can provide for those patients? Yeah, so we, we provide behavioral health intervention support. So that might involve um, things like problem solving strategies for increasing motivation. You know, if you're just not feeling like, you know, doing anything, it's going to be hard to comply with your treatment res regimen, right? With your medical treatment regimen. Um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and anxiety, you know, challenging some of those negative thoughts that kind of come up, um, you know, self care, structuring your, your day, mindfulness. These are all different types of techniques that we use um, to help support people around their mental health concerns. Okay. Um, so Dr. Henley, just a question for you. When you're speaking with one of your patients, maybe someone who's newly diagnosed, what are you looking for in that conversation that might want you to bring in Dr. Johnson? Um, so, you know, if, if there's a feeling that, um, you know, our sort of routine treatment for disease XYZ, they, there's just suboptimal treatment. Um, if, if there's a disconnect between, you know, how they're feeling and how they physically look, you know, if I think, wow, you know, they look really good, their neurologic function is good, but they're, they're, they don't feel that way. You know, they feel poorly. Um, if there's issues with sleep, um, with appetite, um, and, you know, I'll even ask them, what are you doing, you know, to keep yourself busy? What are your hobbies? What are your social interactions? Are you physically active? Are you involved in an exercise program? And if a lot of those things are lacking, um, you know, just assuming that they're having trouble even coping with their disease process, that they don't have a, a true perception of how well they're doing. Um, then I'll start the conversation about, you know, do you feel like you could be depressed? You could be anxious. What are some triggers um, that make you feel poorly? Um, and oftentimes people will open up um, and will um, talk about those things. So yes, we talk about a component of if there's a medication that's needed, um, but then I also reference Dr. Johnson um, and the therapies and the services that she can provide. Um, most of the time, they they're willing to to look into that. You know, this part of this part of the world isn't hasn't been big on that kind of stigma for sure with mental health um, and and even therapy. You know, I don't need therapy. I don't need. Um, and so, you know, it's more of it's not necessarily like couch therapy, but just coping skills. You know, I don't know many side effects of talking to someone 
who could give you strategies and coping skills maybe to make your life better. Um, and so, you know, when you put it that way, a lot of times they, they feel a lot more comfortable with that. And then once they meet her um, and see how wonderful she is, um, you know, I, I think they probably want more appointments than, than she typically um, has them for. So if we can just get over kind of that hump of, you know, feeling like, um, you know, they have mental health issues or that they need therapy, um, it's, it's very, um, we see the results um, very positive. So you did mention something just now, Dr. Henley, that I'd like to touch on, um, the late adoption here in West Texas of mental health, but CMG has made that a priority in the last couple of years. What does that mean for both you as a, a physician treating the physical body and then Dr. Johnson, you can answer separately as a mental health professional. What does it mean to you that Covenant is making this a priority? Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a big deal. Um, you know, I think that, you know, Covenant sees um, that taking care of patients is more than just, um, you know, if I can say this, you know, the high dollar things like surgery and expensive medications um, that only gets us so far. Um, and so I really appreciate having um, an employer in a hospital that does care about about the patient. Um, and that's part of our mission and our vision and how we approach not only the people we take care of, but our employees as well. Um, and so recognizing that um, collaboration like this um, in our clinic. I hope it continues to extend to our other service lines, um, you know, and to reach other clinics in, in the community and the region as a whole. Yes. Yeah. Especially during this time, mm -hmm. during the holidays, during COVID, um, you know, I think part of the mission is, you know, heal me, know me, you know, and therapy, a big piece of, of therapy is getting to actually know someone and what they're going through. And um, sometimes that can be very healing um, to be heard and to be understood. Um, the other piece of the mission, you know, ease my way. And this is another way to kind of ease um, folks way this year and just in general. And Dr. Johnson, you just mentioned kind of our, our mission there, know me, care for me, ease my way. Um, we are a faith-based organization. So how are you able to integrate faith in some of the treatments that you do for those who that's important to them? Yeah, well, I'm in a, a unique um, kind of situation. I'm actually, I was actually trained in a seminary setting um, where, you know, I learned about integration and techniques for integrating faith and practice, um, psychology practice. So I'm actually very, very comfortable with integrating, um, you know, people's faith um, or non-faith backgrounds um, into the work that we do. I find that um, people find a lot of meaning and healing um, and peace. Um, in their faith. And um, I think it, it can be an important and very powerful uh, piece to, to add to the treatment. So Dr. Henley, we've talked a lot about neurological issues and the things that people come and see you for, but can we elaborate a little more specifically on what exactly are people coming to see you for? Is it Alzheimer's, dementia? I know that's a common one and something that's very close to Dr. Johnson's heart, but, but what are people coming in with their new neurological issues? What are they seeing you for? Um, so probably my biggest population is Parkinson's disease. Um, I did a fellowship training in movement disorders. And so I, and um, for reasons that we won't get into in this talk, we have a high incidence of Parkinson's disease in rural West Texas. Um, and so I do have a large population that come in. Um, I doubt, I also see patients with cognitive impairment, dementia, um, of different varieties. Um, so those are probably, um, my biggest, um, patient populations and those would be considered neurodegenerative diseases. So that means inherent to those diagnoses means they worsen over time. They progress over time. Parkinson's definitely in a physical way, in a motor way, in the way they move, um, but also in the way that they that they think, but also perceive their reality. Um, and then, you know, the cognitive impairments, um, definitely in, in terms of their cognition and how that impacts their day-to-day -day life. Okay. With that in mind, Dr. Johnson, um, thinking of the caregivers for those people, I took care of my grandfather when he had um, dementia. He lived with us for a couple of years. What kind of tips are you giving to those people specifically with those two neurological diseases in mind of like how to how to help those family members? Yeah, I think Dr. Henley was on to something earlier when she said, you know, care, self-care. 
um, and getting support yourself if you're a care partner for a loved one is really, really number one priority. Um, you know, it, depending on the different different situations, um, I may make recommendations for behavioral types of strategies that can be used. Um, so, but but I think the number one recommendation is taking care of your yourself because burnout is a real thing. Compassion <laughs> fatigue is a real thing. Um, you know, and you're walking along someone who's who's dealing with um, a very difficult life changes and you're experiencing that yourself. So I think that's probably my number one recommendation is do what you can to take care of yourself um, first. Put your mask on first. Um, right. Like they say on the airline. Um, that's that's the priority. And maybe a little bit of grace that, you know, you're, you might fall a little, but that's OK. You're doing the best you can. Sure. Right. Absolutely. Right. Isn't that a message for all of us in 2020? Yes. 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 Well, I'm going to take a moment and just check and see if any of our um, viewers have some questions that we need to be answering. Um, and while I do that, I just want to ask you both, is there anything else you'd like to add that maybe we haven't discussed just yet? Um, you know, I would just, again, kind of reiterate um, how the importance of mental health um, for all of us and, and definitely for those who have a neurologic condition or are caring for a family member with a neurologic condition. Um, many times the burden of this illness can go beyond not only the a caregiver's physical ability, but also their emotional and their mental capabilities. Um, so if somebody finds themselves, you know, irritable, um, kind of a shorter fuse, sometimes a lot of times those can be signs of anxiety and depression. It's not, it's not somebody who sits and cries all the time. Um, they can be, they can look a little bit different. And so um, just feel free to talk to your primary care doctor about, it. I promise you they're talking about this a lot. Um, and, and also explore things that, that work for them. Um, therapy's great. Um, physical activity is great. Sometimes medications needed, um, but it's not always just a pill to fix it. it it's a lot more than that. Um, and in definitely seeking, um, you know, their faith, if they have a church body, if they have a support group there, I'm really connecting with people that are like-minded um, can also help as we, as we get over the hump and get through um, what hopefully is, is the rest of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions at this time. Oh, we do have one. I apologize. Um, what are some self-care techniques to do during the pandemic? And Dr. Henley, you did answer just a couple of those, but maybe Dr. Johnson wants to elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, I think uh, pleasurable activity scheduling. So scheduling your day-to-day -day activities in general and structuring your day um, is a really important piece of taking care of yourself. You know, when you're kind of sitting around and there, you know, you don't have anything specific to look forward to, you know, all the things you typically look forward to, you can't do anymore. It's easy to start getting focused on those things and getting yourself down. And so I would say schedule something every single day to look forward to, um, whether that be as, as small as, you know, making a smoothie or, you know, whether it, whatever it is for you, watching a funny TV show um, or, you know, whatever it might be, schedule something every single day for yourself to look forward to and structure your days. Well, if you guys are making smoothies in the neuro clinic, I need to stop by yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> you might add that. <laughs> also, I would also add that there are a lot of free apps um, and free, uh, even on YouTube, free mindfulness resources. Um, I, you know, that are out there for people that are guided exercises for mindfulness, um, for kind of finding peace in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, you can just go onto YouTube and, and look up guided mindfulness exercise. And that's a great way to, to practice self care and present moment awareness and and a lot of these kind of techniques um, for free. Wonderful. We like free re resources, don't we? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you ladies so much for your time, Dr. Henley, Dr. Johnson, you, for joining us today. Um, and everyone who is listening and sending in your questions, we appreciate you as well. To learn more about our initiative program services and ways to give, or if you're looking for help or medical advice, you can always visit 
worktobewell.org. And make sure you can follow us on social media at COVHS on Twitter and at Covenant Health on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us. Y'all have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you, guys.